Okay, our next presenter is the fabulous Dr. Faisal Ibrahim, who will present Dignity in Dementia Care. Faisal is a consultant in geriatric medicine with an interest in dementia and delirium at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Faisal is also the clinical director of Dementia Behaviour Management Advisory Services and the chair of the Alzheimer's Australia South Australia Consumer Alliance Group. Faisal proudly champions and leads the Dignity and Care campaign in South Australia with Ms Maggie Beer as the patron. He is also a champion in saving the day for event organisers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Faisal Ibrahim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sit afternoon. Good afternoon, all. Hi, Valda and the rest. Thank you so much. So, just in case, if you look at the program, I'm not Professor Richard Fleming. My name is Faisal Ibrahim. <laughs> uh, I'm so delighted to be here today, and thank you so much. And I think it's so important that I stress that uh, I'm also a consumer. Um, I came back from Malaysia on Sunday, having standing and waiting for two hours for my passport to be stamped at Melbourne Airport. Why? <laughs> because my dad was sick. So uh, he stayed with us for two months in sunny Adelaide and got back home to very smoggy, lots of haze, Malaysia. And he was sick with pneumonia. And he was admitted into two hospitals. You know, I felt the service was fantastic. The kindness was everywhere. But there's a big but. My dad um, uh, do not have dementia. Uh, however, uh, he are, he's prone to have what we call an oxygen-deprived syndrome due to his heart and lungs. And he taught someone on day two at home, um, uh, on returning, someone is in his room uh, putting stuff. So my mom got freaked out big time because uh, she did not understand what's been happening. So my dad had a del delirium. And what I thought was really interesting is that during his stay in those two fabulous hospitals, nobody addressed and talked about brain. You know, my dad was uh, in a heart care center in the center of Kuala Lumpur. I can tell you, on arrival, we were met by a, 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 like an usher or, or person saying, thank you for coming today to our hospital. Uh, this is the parking cut, sir. Please come here visit your dad very often. Now, we were then ushered straight to assessment, and we were told in two hours' time, would you like your dad to be going into a single, shared, or four-bedded room? And my dad's food was fantastic for the 14 days he was in hospital, but nobody seems to be talking about brain. So I really want you to know that today, I really want to make dementia super sexy. You know why? So, <laughs> because I, am re I, I really would like you to understand that we do understand. I do understand, but I want to make sure it's not just, it's not the doom and gloom. It's about giving us hope. It's about give you hope, and I hope that I hope there's a cure one day. But I also hope uh, that one day, and that we can make sure that everywhere in Australia, everyone will be timely diagnosed, and making sure that the families are supported to be navigated to get support that they deserve. And I know this morning the fabulous Velda and Robin and Dr. Donna was here talking. And you know what? Uh, I asked Velda about three weeks ago. I said, Velda, I need your help, please. Robin, I need your help. Because you know what? They're wanting to stop older person assessment service in regional South Australia. Would you say yes to that, gang? You wouldn't. So your voice, we need one person to talk and voice. Now, I'm going to go back to the topic of my talk today, and that's about dignity. So what is dignity in care? So it's about the principle. So I really wanted to share with you what are the principles. And if you ask me for the past fortnight when I was living and observing, it's about engaging with family. It's about giving that personalized service that everyone deserves. It doesn't matter whether you speak Malay, Japanese, or Italian, or Greek, or whatever languages, and also to respect your faith, background, and spirituality. So I believe. My dad's only complaint was they did not provide him with a nail clipper. Would you believe it? <laughs> but he got one from me anyway. But, but it's so important that... Um, I always show this. I don't know whether you like this photo, but I love it. Because you know why? Uh, yesterday, I was, I was uh, being interviewed with a few others, uh, with uh, Peter Gers, and he'll be here this afternoon. And, and one thing that I really remembered from that meeting with him uh, before uh, in a previous setting, that his memory of experience of his close friend who, who fought and died from dementia 
are still clear as if it was yesterday. And I so believe that, you know, the, my, your memories or the memories of people that you care and love and still loving. And I, I do believe dignity and care is not just about, you know, about giving those 10 principle, but valuing that you are the experts. I know you met and heard many experts this morning. You met Dr. Caddy Short, Associate Professor uh, Mark Yates, and many more this morning. But you know what? It's not us. You are the expert. You are guiding us to make sure we give the best service for your loved one. Can I just see the show of hands in here who have got dementia and caring for those with dementia, please? So thank you for coming. Really, thank you so much. Now, uh, I also wanted to, to, to share you my experience why uh, I'm going to use the word Dignity in Care Australia. When I first started work in Australia, that was about 14 years ago in Sydney, and I was asked to look after a ward. And I remembered one day I was asked to look after a young uh, lady who at that time was diagnosed with early onset or young onset dementia. And one thing that I do remember, the word spoken by her was, I want to speak to King George. I want to speak to King George. That was continuous. Whatever she wanted to say, the word was repetitive. I want to speak to King George. And there I was thinking, oh my gosh, what I'm going to be doing now? Because I need to make sure that she gets home to be kept for uh, and, and to make sure that the treatment are what she deserves. And you know, the next day I came to work uh, and I realized that uh, there was someone playing music or some piano in the day room. It was she. You know what? She played Beethoven piano sonata. It was fantastic, beautiful. I realized that, you know, dignity in care is about knowing one likes and dislike. It's making sure that if we are unable to contact the family, there must be someone that can voice and tell us what are the person's, you know, life experiences. And to me, dignity in care is not just about the 10. It's making sure that all of you are involved actively as the, care, as, 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 as the expert when we help or we are, we are looking after the person that that we looked after. If that person were to be in where I work, for instance, and it were to be his or her last destination for whatever condition in life, you know what? It must be the best one. So we talk a lot about today prevention, about what is dementia. But let's not forget like the end of life in dementia is so, so important. And not forget about the loss and the grief that could last years and years after. And those persons that have been helping and caring and support, we need to make sure those experts are not forgotten. Do you understand me? And it's so important that we do that. And the slides that you see now are the champions. So I'm so grateful and ever still grateful when I first, when we first met Catherine Quintel, who is the CEO of Alzheimer's SA, and I said, Catherine, why don't we join up and start the campaign called Dignity in Care? And that happened about, gosh, four or five years now. We've grown. We've grown and we have, and we are now the only partner, international partner from Dignity in Care UK. And you can see uh, the partners include the list, the long list of the aged care sector. You know what the formula is to help to make sure that dementia care is super sexy, everyone? It's three E's. Education, education, education. And to me, there's no compromise. It's so important that it translates not just to aged care, but to schools. We need to make sure we teach the young one, the young one, so that when they grow older, they will like to become an aged care nurse, an aged care doctor, and and providing service to those vulnerable. And to me, that is super essential. Now, I also wanted to share with you why we are so excited this year, because with the, uh, uh, the, the uh, development or the, 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 the expansion of from Dignity in Care South Australia to Dignity in Care National, we are holding our first ever conference. And the conference is about dignity, but focusing on food and nutrition. If you wish to hear about what are the strategies or steps to prevent weight loss in early dementia presented by one of the Alzheimer's leading workers, please come next week on Friday at the Wine Centre. Also, perhaps if you wanted to know if our loved one is allowed to have Kentucky Fried Chicken, that's my favourite food by the way, <laughs> at the last hours of my life, give me two bucketfuls. <laughs> 
because because you know what? it's important. I want to tell you why I'm not like last night. I know I promoted KFC to Peter Gers and the people that listen, but because when I was a young toddler, when I did well in school, when I behaved well, my mom and dad reward me with Kentucky Fried Chicken. My dad doesn't say I love you so openly, but you know what he does? He would say, he would give a, 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 a five-piece meal to his sister who was dying at that time, saying, and that to me is language of love. So if I were to be having a dementia or any syndrome, if I'm unwell and depressed, you know what you give me? Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> but also, every morning I spend an hour with my loved ones. Those are 400 budgies, parrots, and pets that I've got. Now, please bring those pets to me at a QEH and make sure I'm with them all the time. Do you think that will happen, Catherine? No chance. But I want to also hear you. I want to hear you uh, nominating yourself, your friends, the people that you know who are champions of dignity and care, who's been voicing, who's been fighting, who's been telling the policymakers, right, guys, it's enough, it's enough. You know, I remember the first time I heard a, 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 a spoken a lecture by an inspirational lecturer in dementia uh, care in England by uh, P Professor uh, a lady professor, and then she taught me, Faisal, you know, when I was young, when I was really young, uh, I remember my mum, my, 50 years ago, my mum cannot spend the night with me in the hospital when she was young, and she remembered her mum waving at her like that. Do you know, uh, it took 50 years for England, people in the UK, to allow mum and dad to stay over, to care, to be with their, their toddler, a young one. And how long more do we have to wait for dementia care in South Australia? Another 50 years? I do not think so. I think it's important that uh, today's meeting is about you know, celebrating that we have a lot of fantastic you know, resources, people like yourself, but we need to make sure we learn. We need to share international expertise. One of my best friends is actually here, that's Dr. Amalia Spiropoulou. I know she's hiding over there. <laughs> and we work in this, or we work in, in, a, in a hospital in England, in Birmingham. I remember it vividly when I came back from Australia in, um, 14 years ago. I was asked to look after a lady who knew she was dying. And she told me, Faisal, I know I'm dying, but I must say goodbye to my best mate. Of course you can. Of course you can. But I wasn't aware that it was a 14-year-old dog called Dennis. Now tell me, tell me. <laughs> At that time, did they allow pets to come out into a hospital area? Dalda, no. You know what? She died without saying goodbye. I was upset. There are policies, protocol, procedures. But what about humanity? Dignity in care is about, you know what? Reigniting humanity. The torch that we carry, we need to make it bigger and bigger, like the Olympic torch. There's lots more stories to tell, but one thing that I do remember is a, a, a patient that I look after, and, and I do remember this so clearly. And I came to work in the morning uh, for a walk round, and I saw four strong, big security guards. This is in Birmingham. And they were trying to prevent this lady uh, called Isla to return, to, to, to say, you cannot leave, you must stay here. And she was distressed, she was upset. You know what she was looking for? She was looking for her eggs. We do not know what X meant at that time. You know what she was looking for? Her pair of shoes. So it's important that we need to understand, you know, before we start to resort to those, what we call escalation and using the wrong languages. We're not going to be using the word disease. We're going to be using no more aggression. We need to make sure the word that describes humanity. And it's so important that we do this. So Ding Ding Care is to make sure that we see how we can improve. I'm so fortunate, you know, I'm so fortunate that number one, that I'm living and working in South Australia. I'm so fortunate there are fantastic services and people like yourself. But also I'm glad that where I work in Central Adelaide, that's include the QEH, the Ra, Hampstead, St. Margaret's and teams of the community felt that they wanted to do something. So the first video today, now I just want to make sure that this thing works. This thing doesn't work though. Testing? It, it does work. <laughs> I really want to make sure, if you could, if you can see this, please tell me that, uh, does this actually voice 
dignity and care to you because I do hope it does. And the idea was 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 actually ignited by team at Cleveland. This is in the States. And we said to them, look, we wanting to do something good, but we wanted to make sure that our staff is aware that there's a lot more we can do. So this is the first video today. And I do have an hour, don't I, Brenda? Right? Yeah.
You know, I shared this video because I love Googling, YouTubing many things. So I shared this with one of my other best friends who is actually a pediatrician in England, in, in central London. And he showed that uh, to his colleagues at the Grand Round and they made it compulsory for all doctors starting at their hospitals to watch this video. And to me, this is great. This is South Australian innovation. But we need to have more of this. The next video, I showed this to one of my friends, Jenny. I think she's in this room somewhere. I know she's smiling now. I can see her. But it's so important that you know this. And I have to apologize that because this is, will tell you what is Alzheimer's disease. There are many, many types, 100 plus types. We are still learning. We haven't got a cure, but you know what? You need to know what is A and what is Z. The most important thing I need to tell you and tell my patients is that there are two things guaranteed in life, paying taxes and death. But how do we get there? We need to make sure it's the best, or in my words, glamorous, fabulous possible, please. It's so important. And it's also important, I think, I share you this video because we need to be, we need to make sure that dementia is just not about memory. It's about how things that can be affected. My work with Alzheimer's on Friday with DBMAS, that's Dementia Behavioral Management Advisory Services, is to make sure we support people, families, aged care workers, hospitals. And sometimes we do well, sometimes we don't because we are still learning. But if you were to see this video, perhaps what you heard this morning and maybe more uh, from Mark Yates and from Katie Short, and please ask questions at the end if you need me to tell you uh, what I've learned. I've learned this when I was in Vancouver about four years ago, and I thought, and I still think this is the best video that I can teach and help uh, my students to understand. So I thought I'd share it with you today. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in ten people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain, where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination, and in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.org.
you know why I show you this video? Because I've heard many voices, many families, many carers, many people with dementia telling me, why Dr. Ibrahim? When I saw this doctor this before, they never told me that it would affect my balance. They never told me that it would affect this, this, this. You know, I remembered my friend Jenny when I showed this, picture, uh, this video and, I, and Jenny said, this video is fantastic. And, and, and I also met other people that said, this is too much for me to take, but you know what? We need to make sure when you, when the families, when people with dementia come and see us in our services, in our clinic, we need to give them hope because there's a lot we can do. We can make sure that whatever step stages, we can give the best possible options of care. We might not be able to cure the condition, but you know what? There's a lot we can do. We'll start with kindness first. We start to hear and communicate well with whatever way is possible. And this is why I want you to spread this video like viral, please. It's so important that we know what is dementia. Now, the 10 principles, as you probably see, you know, or, or, that I talk. Okay. This is what I need to share with you again and again, is to make sure that if somebody or someone comes to uh, under in our care, say at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, you know, I, I remember this, and I'm sure Amalia would agree with me. Uh, there's one thing that I've not seen. I've not seen restraints. I've not seen people who are vulnerable, people who are unwell, people who are unwell with dementia come to our hospitals. And because we do not understand them, uh, the treatment that they receive are restraints. Restraints can, can, form, can be formed in many, many ways, in physical, in medication restraints. And also, I do not understand how we can do this when in some parts of the world it's actually not legal. So I first saw this in South Australia and I thought, how can this be happening? Did someone walk up 20 years ago and tell the doctors and nurses and everyone else, it's okay to do this? It's not okay. Why I show a picture of a Spider-Man? Because when people are restrained, they become like this on the bed. Do you understand me? We need to stop this because it's inhuman. And you know what? For the past six, seven years, we see a lot of transformation, education, understanding. But we need to do more. We need to make sure that the family I engage about the problems, the use and disuse of antipsychotics, for instance. When it's good, it's good. But when it's bad, it could kill people too. I also want to share with you about a case that I saw, a gentleman that I saw my first, second day in Adelaide. A gentleman who was quite distressed because he was, un he was unwell like my dad. He also had pneumonia and he was so upset in the morning and worse. And that night he was restrained, or what the word is shackle. You know what he wanted actually? He wanted in his language, in Polish, a cup of coffee. So I cannot understand why we, uh, as those who should be caring and kind, doesn't understand the concept of living in Australia, you have 200 plus languages. One in eight Aussies not speak English at home. Where I work in the Western suburb, 40% of my clients or patient consumer do not speak English as a second language. I need to be mindful. The only way to change is to make sure we work from the below and the top. Let me check in this room how many of us here are healthcare workers in hospitals or aged care. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. You know why? It's so important we say thank you to you. One thing that you saw is, I believe, if you are happy doing your job, because I, I think the, the, the merit or the, uh, the, the, the pay uh, is what, why you sign for this job, because you love, you're passionate about your role and your job. And I think it's so important that you know, the, uh, the employer say thank you and making sure that this happened con because if I'm happy, you're happy, you know what? You'd be smiling every time when you see a patient coming to you. Am I right? Of course, definitely. Now, uh, this is what I need every day. I need my Kentucky Fried Chicken, seriously, big time. I need my <laughs> parrots and pets, but also I need to make sure you know me, my identity, my history. You know what? Love. Love is important. I remember when I first met Velda and Robin years ago, three years ago. What did I tell you? I tell you, Robin. I said, remember that lady, the bride that walked down the aisle and say, I do. And we always start this in all of our clinics. It's important to treasure the memories that we have. You know, 
there are of course lots of lots more you know uh, uh, examples to show but it's so important that I, I show you the next one too this is what I, happened to me I was in Milan not long ago and I saw this everywhere in Milan in English saying get fit or get fat now Pfizer I told myself six years ago am I going to get fatter and fatter and see these things happening now restraints all those things we need to change but we need to change with kindness we need to why not one we need to cupcakes and caffeine coffee our ceos our executive director of nursing including all the aged care sector we need to bring everyone together in unity to make sure let's use one word and maybe the word is dignity in care you know why the formula is working and that's what we're meeting next week to celebrate with the governor with lots of people to talk this is something that we need to do we might not have much money, but you know what, gang, we have a lot of goodwill here. <laughs> now, Dignity in Care started because of not because of you, not me, because of you, consumers saying, you know, it's not right for my dad, my mum, to be prematurely admitted into a nursing home when they come to your hospital. Do you understand me? Dignity in Care is about the voice saying, look, you know, yes, my dad is dying today. Why did you give him a Kentucky Fried Chicken? Why, you do, why did you keep him or kept him nailed by mouth? So when the consumers get together, you have people and, and now the champions or the champions called Dignity in Care champions has grown close to 70,000 in the UK. We have thousands here. I know we have close to three, 4,000 in Australia, but we need all of you to say, yes, I'm a champion, and we're going to have our voice stronger. Now, why this happened? Because people, uh, BBC Panorama showed segments like this in, the, in television. Tonight on Panorama, a care home for the elderly. It's just totally sadistic. A daughter takes matters into her own hands to protect her mother. So I've just dumped her on the just bed. Dumped, yeah. Two nights inside an elderly care home, filmed on secret camera. You could hear the poor lady cry out in pain. People were being treated with less respect than slabs of meat and the fight to prevent other vulnerable old people suffering the same abuse. How can you actually go into a home where abuse has actually happened and it's literally been caught on film and then turn around and say that it's compliant? Now, we don't see this here. We don't. I know we don't. But I want to share you a story about a client or a family. I got an email from a son of a patient with dementia that I actually was involved with three, four years ago. And he said, mom is not happy living in her home. That's the nursing home that she was at. She always wants to go home every day. She always called the taxi. Every time when she was brought back, she gets upset and crying. She lost a lot of weight. You know, I said, wow, you know what? From my understanding of this, I think that's not her home, you see. Let's talk about this home. And I said, Today, I know from my visits and my, uh, my involvement, this is the best care home that I'll put myself <laughs> if I were to have dementia or to be unwell. You know what? In two weeks' time, in that two weeks, the son brought mom to that home. So, and I got an email the second day the mom was in from the son, the night. And he wrote and emailed, oh my gosh, what's happened now? And he said, Dr. Ibrahim, I'm going to tell and share you what's happened to me today. I went to see my mom in this new nursing home. And she was standing with a friend, arm to arm, and said, I cannot speak to you now because I'm going to a class exercise. And she said, it so feels so good not to be wanted, Faisal. Because you know why? The mom found her home. And I saw the lady the week after. So we can do this. It's important that families like the champion, ladies and gentlemen, said, you know, and to me, those are stories that actually exemplify and, and share dignity and care. When me and Amalia we used to work in one of these buildings in Birmingham, uh, I, I remembered this. I remembered uh, to make things work, to make sure that pets come in, to make sure that flowers can be allowed into our wards. You know, it's important that we work with executive but not to forget the cleaners, the housekeeper, the porters. And that's so, so important. And also it's important that we identify problems. So our problems at that time, this is at that time, was about you know, addressing those issues, about how do we communicate? How do we communicate about people being discharged, about dementia, delirium, spirituality? And you know what? 
Uh, with that, with that movement in one place, in one hospital, suddenly pets come in. You see lots of pictures here. I remembered my lovebirds used to come in the afternoon, walk around, not as a doctor, but as a person. You know, we see people say, look, Faisal, I'm a social worker, but I've just learned and passed my guitar lessons. I'm happy to come twice a week to play guitar. And a matron come in and say, I know to get free, where to get free flowers from, from a florist, and I want to do flower arrangement with Sister Margaret. And those to me are dignity and care. And those to me, patients that come to me, Faisal, I was the first group, in the first group of the fun aerobics. You know what, take one pound coin, because, because I really want to contribute, then you can buy more CDs or Sinatra so that people can enjoy the next fun aerobics in the world. And this was first done in UK. And we've done the same in the QEH too. And I believe that the voice of the volunteers, because volunteers, I'm so, so happy that Australians, you know, this is something that we're proud about and I think we need to promote volunteers, not just in HK, but in our acute care setting. And I also believe it's not just about talking about dementia, talking about things that matters to us, about equity, about equality, you know, about diversity. And also, you know, when we talk about hospitals, and I do hope the new RAH, with the announcement last year that they will have 700 single beds or single rooms, but they will also allow day beds. And that means the family and carers can stay if they wish. And to me, it's, something, it's a triumphant change in South Australia. But it's also the important the new rust start to think to make and develop a bit more dignified hospital gown. Do you understand? And it's, important, it's important to think about my mum would never stay in a mixed ward, I can tell you that for sure. So a single sex accommodation ward is necessary, I think for that to happen. So there's a lot more, but we need to also think about what if, you know, I remembered, uh, I, I, I remembered very, oh gosh, what's happened here? Uh, I remembered this, uh, if you, let show you this slide now, yeah. Uh, I remember the, this, when I went to visit about two years ago, oh gosh, so that's a grambling in the TV, sorry, but uh, see what's happening, okay. I remember visiting the same hospital about two years ago and they said we have introduced uh, robots to follow our doctors and nurses in emergency so that if we need to put a catheter at night, we can at least attempt to get a translator as, you know, uh, as opposed to shoving it without any consent. And to me, that's an attempt, it's an attempt to ignite humanity. But also to have volunteers that's able to use technology. So you see Daniel, so David Coase used to, do, uh, to run uh, the program volunteers in that hospital. And I remember uh, he showed me with a client age 96 called Harry. And Harry never touched a computer in his life, but this computer can talk. But also this computer can play his favorite jazz music and watch and also and as well dial and speak to his daughter who at that time was living in New Zealand. And to me, this is what we can do because computers are normal now in hospital. There's a lot we can do. But also I would like one day that I could perhaps reduce my uh, 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 I, I, I'm not good at this. I'm not good of, I, I always interrupt people and I'm not good. But I wish one day I can learn from this fantastic champion that says she works as a director of nursing in Guy St. Thomas's in London, central London. You know, she said, I would like from today, everybody that works in this building, my nurses or people outside nursing too, to make sure that you do not interrupt your patients. Please let them to complete their sentences. You know how hard it is for me to do that? Almost impossible. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm learning, but you know what? We need to learn from Dignity Champions and she's definitely one of them. Now, can I tell you, Brenda, how much time do I have left? Sorry? How much time do I have left? Sorry. I'm Anytime, my gosh. Okay, because I know Mark stole. I know Mark stole sometimes, but it doesn't matter. We like all like Mark. So I'm going to. You know what? I really feel that I felt that you really wanted to uh, to hear uh, Richard uh, Professor Fleming talk about environment. So I was in Stirling University uh, uh, last year. In fact, almost every year now. And I wanting to learn about how environment. Uh, can make the difference, and I believe so. So I thought, as a, as a special treat to myself and to everybody, I'm just going to skip a lot of slides and go straight to my visit to Stirling University. Um, why I think I believe this is important, because you know what? There's a lot that we can do. A lot of hospital buildings are very clinical, very wide. Even the floors, you, cannot, you can see even a hair on the floor, but this is not what home is. 
this is not sanctuary for our patients. So we need to change. So I do. I, I, I just slide this down. Sorry. Yeah. So I went to visit Sterling. You know what was nice as you arrived by the train? They said welcome to UK's first dementia-friendly city. To me, that's fantastic. I keep on talking. I wish Port Lincoln would be the first in Austria. I wish Glendale would be the first suburb in Adelaide. We can do this. But also what's beautiful is that they have universities. You have people investing energy and time using with all the local interest experts to get the best design possible. But they haven't forgotten this to work with the local communities, the council. So as a person in the community in Stirling, I could use my iPad and check what's happening. What's happening so that I can live up, I can be engaged with perhaps men shed activities or whatever therapy so that I would not be lonely at home. Or if I were to have dementia, I want to know what's the most sexy today in Stirling. And this is what's beautiful working with, this is what we call dementia-friendly community because you engage everybody. And also, you know, I thought that was really beautiful, is this. How often do you see a, a restaurant called Kilted Kangaroo? <laughs> but they got one. So these are just some of the pictures. And I thought one thing to introduce to yourself is the building is called Iris Murdoch, who's, who's an uh, Irish author who has or, or, or died from a dementia syndrome. And I went to visit, I met Jilly Paulson. So she gave me a tour. And I like about this place because it's about person-centered. Before we can do person-centered care, we must understand what it means. You know what she showed me? Faisal, I'm going to show you to our little holes. Oh my God, what is that, Jilly? So can you see those little, uh, uh, little holes like that? So those are each of the members of the workers for that place. So what is important to Jilly? So she showed me children, family, mom and dad, hobbies. If we do not believe in that, how on earth are we going to provide a dignified person-centered care? And I believe in that sincerely, that doing that. But also to understand that colours, music, strategies uh, can actually help for people who is not living well with dementia. And I remember this very, very clearly because, you know, we went to a design, like an IKEA suite. You know, because I was, I was born in Malaysia, but I grew up in Dublin Island and then later, 20 plus years in the UK. I remembered this. I remembered this. I remember in Ireland, uh, the terrace homes, the front door are painted bright red, yellow or blue with copper plated letter box. So if you spend $20 Australian to buy a laminated red with a copper plated and put them in a nursing home where a lady who was born in Ireland, you know how wonderful that lady to wake up in the morning to receive a post via a copper plated with a doll like that. She'll be so happy and it costs less than $50. And to me, that's about innovation. But to understand that carpets like this might actually fail from audit, because you know what? It looks like you have little insects crawling on the carpet. So all looking at the carpets now. <laughs> but also, it's important for me to understand that if I were to put a different color or mismatched color, say a toilet mat, on top of this, it might be that person with dementia might refuse to go into the bath because he's falling or she's falling into the void. Do you understand? But also, it's important that when we talk about these instruments or designs, we're not asking family to go home and change the color of the plates or the carbon sources into yellow, blue or red. No, we're asking to use what's normal for the person, but also to use simple like changing to perspex like that so that people can see and uh, this is where we keep the utensils or the cutlery. And also, I thought it was really, really sensible that, you know, tools to call the loved one, you know, as opposed to the numbers and ABC from the phone, do something that people can see and actually identify the face of people that love loved one. And, you know, how often do we see, you know, uh, in hospital, it's time for you to have aerobic exercise, to have hydrotherapy. Uh, what are you having for menu? I know in Amsterdam, in some hospitals, pain tree. Uh, patients and staff can eat together. And I know that the patient can point out as they've pushed the trolley with the tear, I want that food because people can smell the food. And I know in a dignified nursing home in England, they actually inject the smell of shepherd's pie pre lunchtime so that people get hungry. <laughs> and I do know that at the new ride, they're not going to have a green or a yellow or a red switch. They don't because you know what? Engagement doesn't happen. And I do believe, you know, we, uh, you, me as a consumer, 
can ensure that we can make little changes. We can spend one dollar from Kmart and get a different colour placemat so that we can entice the appetite for your loved one who are perhaps not eating well that day. But also it's important that we communicate better. You know, I've seen a lot of people for the past two weeks when I was in Malaysia, people who was unable to sign or read or choose what they wanted to eat. My dad could, but some couldn't. But maybe if you show them a picture, it's going to be a steak lunch, they know what it is, you know? It's so important that we have those. But again, with technology, there's a lot of robots. I was in Japan in February this year with the Dementia Research Center for Japan. You know what they told me? Oh, Faisal, we don't believe in that. I said, oh my gosh, and this is Japan. Because they believe in people. They believe in you and me, people providing the care. Why are we replacing human when, uh, with robots when we can do it better? And to me, I was just gobsmacked. I went home thinking, oh my gosh, but I believe there's a room for robotics, but something. And lastly, before I finish, Marianne, I, I just wanted to show you this again, because it's important that we talk, we educate young people. We need more people to sign up to become geriatricians, nurses, allied health, to make sure they become our champion, dementia and living care champion. And also, if plan A doesn't work to everyone here, there are how many alphabets? 25 more letters. And I believe in lots of coffee, lots of tea, cupcakes, wine and dine. Make sure that people help us. Make sure that we give the best care possible. And please don't forget to check Dignity in Care dot com dot au and i do know uh, uh laurie is at the back wave laurie if you need more information about coming to our conference our conference is mine and yours it's alzheimer's conference aged care conference health conference next week at the wine center come and learn about not just about food nutrition about how to prevent weight loss talk about and i do i'm looking forward to hear a professor uh, from uh, the north talking about be merry because tomorrow you will die so this is about <laughs> enjoying food before but you know what? Come, and I do believe that there is a concession price for families and carers and people with dementia. Only $45, not $200 plus. Is that right, Laurie? So thank you for uh, inviting me, everyone, and I wish you all the very best.